Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so welcome everyone to the SNAP seminar series. So today we're very happy to have uh, Alessandro Alotto uh, joining us. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Alessandro, uh, he's Associate Professor of Business Administration and Mathematics uh, at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business. Um, his research interests are in applied probability, stochastic modeling, uh, stochastic dynamic programming, and then their applications. Um, and he's a recipient of the Career Award from NSF and a winner of uh, the 2021 Best Publication Award uh, of the Informs Applied Probability Society. Uh, today, he's going to talk about uh, on a constant regret in multi secretary and in dynamic resource allocation problems. Uh, yes, Alessandro. Okay, thank you so much, Yuan. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for uh, organizing this seminar series uh, and, uh, and thanks for, uh, for having me. Uh, so the, the, the goal of the talk today is to talk a bit about uh, um, stochastic packing problems. And I'm gonna do it in a, in a couple of ways. So I'm gonna start with a, multi a single dimensional formulation and we're gonna be talking about a multi secretary problem in which we have a budget and we are uh, seeing applicants arriving over time and we wanna select essentially the, the best um, K of them in, in some fashion. And then I'm gonna um, use the insights we get from the solution of the, the multi-secretary problem to sort of talk about what we can say about uh, multiple dimensions. The goal of the talk is to focus on regret. So we're gonna be looking at the differences between the offline solution, meaning the solution of a profit that has full information Oh, and get, uh, get to see all of the, the arrivals and all of the rewards before making uh, any decision um, against some good uh, uh, online uh, algorithm. And uh, the online algorithm that I'm gonna discuss is gonna be called budget ratio. I'm gonna go in de into detail in, uh, for it uh, in the, um, the multi-secretary version of the problem. And then I will tell you how we generalize this uh, to multiple dimensions. Now, um, the, the talk is based on a couple of papers. Uh, the first one, which is the one about the multi-secretary problem is joint work with Vitaly Gervich, is uh, a couple of years old. And then uh, the, the second paper that takes care of the multiple, multiple dimensions is joint work with Vitaly Gervich, Alberto Vera, and Eli Levin. And that's something that we are currently revising uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for submission. So let's let just get uh, started. So let me start with the multi-secretary problem. So here is the, the framework. So we have a pool of uh, T applicants and uh, each applicant is given a value or a reward depending on how you wanna call it. And we need to select at most I naught applicants to maximize the expected sum of the, of the selected values, okay? So, um, so in particular, if I go over the, the timeline of, of the decisions, Oh, we have a number of positions, which we can, uh, which I'm also going to refer to as initial inventory or budget. This is the value I naught. This is known to the decision maker. We have T arriving values. So T is our horizon. And uh, for every period, there is an arrival. We get to see the realization of some, some random variable B superscript T, which is a reward from some known distribution we find at support. And we're going to assume that those rewards are independent um, over time. And then uh, the information that we have available is whenever a, a um, uh, applicant, whenever there is an arrival in each period, we get to see the value of that applicant. We get to see the realization of that, of that reward. The decision we need to make is after the reward is revealed, the decision maker needs to decide whether to select the arriving value and deplete one unit of, of budget or not. Okay, so here is the trade-off, right? So we have a budget of I naught, we have T period, I naught is smaller than T, and we need to decide which values to select with the goal of maximizing the expected sum of, of the selected values, okay? Now, let me just say a couple of things here. So the first one is, of course, this is a problem that, that can be solved by dynamic programming, right? So, so there is no course of dimensionality issue showing up here, you're gonna, uh, formulate your dynamic program and solve it by backward induction. We're not gonna do that today. We're gonna focus on some heuristic that performs well, and then we're gonna use the insights that come from that heuristic to tackle the, the multidimensional multi problem. So 
Or let me just also give you a couple of references how this problem pops up in the literature. So this is, uh, you can view this problem as a special case of the dynamic and stochastic knapsack problem. So here we have unitary weight, meaning uh, whenever a value is selected, the budget or the inventory goes down by one. And we have independent random reward. Those are the values we get to see when, when there is an arrival. Uh, this is also known as the single resource capacity control revenue management problem. You have uh, I, he not um, seed uh, to sell uh, in, uh, in, in to arriving customer. You have different fare classes, and you wanna uh, sell those units of capacity to, to arriving customers. Uh, another way, another place where this uh, problem shows up it is dynamic market clearing, in which you have uh, uh, items that you wanna allocate to arriving bids, and then uh, the formulation that. Uh, I started with, which is the more the human resources uh, formulation, which you want to hire a uh, given number of applicants, given that you get to see a pool of, of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about what is the offline solution of this problem, right? The offline solution of this problem is going to be pretty straightforward. If I get to see all of the values before making any decision, what am I going to do? I'm just going to sort the values from the largest to the smallest, and I'm going to select the top I not such values, okay? And so that, that simple structure is gonna give us enough information that we can leverage to construct a simple adapt, adaptive policy. And then I'm gonna show that that simple adaptive policy as regret that is uniformly bounded in the number of period and in the budget. And what is the regret here? The regret here is the expected difference between uh, the value of the offline solution and the value of the best online online algorithm. Okay, so I'm going to show that that regret is a, uh, is a constant, and that constant does not depend on the horizon and does not depend on uh, on the budget. Okay, so let me see if there are any questions about the the general framework that I that I just introduced. Good, perfect. So so then. Uh, let me uh, let me just continue and feel free to interrupt me if there is something that pops up. Just unmute yourself and uh, and speak up. So um, I mentioned it already. We're going to take the reward distribution to be uh, supported on a finite set. I'm going to add the possible values of reward to be v n through v one, where v one is the highest reward you can get when you select an arrival, and v n is the smallest. Uh, they are sorted, they are all positive, and then we have that PJ is the probability of seeing a VJ arrival, okay? So, oh, as I mentioned, the offline solution is trivial. You sort them, you take all of the V1 that you can. If you have any remaining budget, you use it to take the V2s. If you have any remaining budget, you use it to take the V3s, and, and so on and so forth. Now, um, if I'm going to count the number of arrivals of any given type, so this uh, letter capital Z sub J of T is what? This is the number of VJ values that I get to see. Then I'm just gonna exhaust them um, in, in making my selection in the, in the offline solution. What does it mean? It means that the number of selections of V1 types is the minimum between how many I get to see of that type and what is the budget of I have, that I have. Whatever is left, I use it to select the V2 types and so on and so forth, right? So, so I'm gonna go in decreasing order according to their um, the value, and then I'm gonna um, adjudicate all of the um, you know all of the arrivals according to the value, and so whatever is left, I use it for the for the next value, and so on and so forth. Now, why is this? This is pretty simple, and why did I write it uh, uh, in this in this fancy way? Well, pretty much to say that this this these minimization problems are essentially trivial meaning that for most of the indices, for most of the value levels, uh, I either take in expectation all of the ones that arrive or none of the ones that arrive up to constant. And why? Essentially by concentration, right? We have a binomial number of arrivals of any given type, and I'm taking the minimum between whatever is some budget and that number, and uh, uh, if I'm uh, uh, far away enough from whatever is the expected value of that binomial distribution, then things are things are uh, work well. Now, what does this mean? It means that there is a index J naught such that all of the rewards that are better 
then uh, Bj not minus one are selected. All of the rewards then that are worse than Bj not plus two are rejected. And so the only action, the only place where this minimization problem is non-trivial is for the value Bj not and for the value Bj not plus one. Right? Those are the only two values for which there is something different from either rejecting all of them or uh, selecting all of them up to constants in, uh, in expectation, okay? So, so this J0 essentially gives me a index. And what is this index? This is a function of the number of periods and the function of the budget. And this is the index that corresponds to where the ratio budget over time falls with respect to the midpoint of the jumps of the survival function. Okay, and I'm gonna show you a picture in a second uh, to, to show you what that means. But given my two input time and budget, I'm gonna find this index, which has to do with the structure of the survival function. And that is the index that gives me the two values that are at play. The values that are better than those, I take pretty much all of them. The values that are worse than those, I reject all of them. Okay, so, so then I'm gonna essentially decompose the offline solution. And I'm gonna set some parameter epsilon, which is the smallest value of the probability mass function divided by two. And, and then I'm gonna say, well, for any, for any given pair of time and budget, I'm gonna find my index such that all of the arrivals that are better than uh, uh, that index are selected in expectation up to a constant. Uh, all of the arrivals that a value that is worse than the value driven by the index are rejected, except for a constant number of them in expectation. And then I have these two cutoff values that are uh, for which things are non trivial. So the value of the offline solution is given by the value of all of the good rewards that are all selected, plus the constant that comes from the expected number of bad rewards that happen to be selected. And then I have in the middle the non trivial solution of what happens with the two boundary E values, BJ0 and BJ0 plus one. Okay, so I have this decomposition that comes from the offline solution. So the idea is well, if I can find a policy that matches this, meaning that selects all of the good types, that rejects all of the bad types, and that does close to the offline policy for the two values that are non-trivial, then I, I'm in good shape, okay? So that, that's essentially the, the goal of, uh, of our algorithm, which is trying to mimic um, this policy in, for, for most of the time period. So we're gonna find some stopping time such that up to the stopping time, the online policy is gonna mimic the offline policy closely. And then uh, um, after that stopping time, uh, things are gonna be different, but the stopping time is in, a, is in expected value, a constant away from the end of the horizon. And so things, things work out fine. So okay. let me, yes. Alexandra? Right. Yes. So maybe I got a little lost in the notation. What is conceptually being bounded by a constant here? Is it, because I guess there's no fudge factors as far as the all or nothing ones. The only thing that's up for grabs, as you said, is the, the, the interesting thing. So what about the interesting thing is bounded by one over four epsilon here, or am I confused? What? No, so, so very good. So, so one over four epsilon is just the, what? This is the expected number of the bad types that happen to be selected. The, there is gonna be some uh, discussion that is coming next, which is uh, the difference between the expected number of uh, um, values at play that are selected by the offline solution, and the expected number of values at play that are selected by a online algorithm. And that we need to show that those are a constant away from each other. And this is only the one, uh, this is the, the slightly non-trivial part in this, because I need to make sure that for those for which the minimization is non-trivial, then uh, I, can, I can sort of do the same sort of stuff, right? So I will need to show that my online algorithm selects up to a constant, the same as the offline uh, uh, solution for those particular two types. But I, that, does that make sense? This slide, is the one over four epsilon bounding something just in terms of the offline or no? Uh, yes, the one over four epsilon here is just bounding some, something in terms of the offline. And what is that? That is the expect, that is the, the constant that you are away from, uh, um, you know, from the either 
okay, so, so one over four epsilon is either the expected number of bad types that you select under the offline solution, so or- when you say bad types, you mean at the boundary case where there's some um, on this level, some on that level, that's the number at the lower level? In no, the I, mean the one, I mean the one worse than that. But I thought you just, isn't it all or nothing for everything except the two that are on the boundary? I think I'm confused. Yeah, up, up to constant. It's all or nothing. Any, anytime I'm saying all or nothing, it's going to be all of, all, all of all, I see. All or okay, nothing now up I, to constant. I understand. And that's the constant that shows up there. I understand. Right? So in the, in the all, I can be off by a constant, which is for epsilon. In the nothing, I can be off by a constant that is one over four epsilon. And for the two values that are at play, we'll need to see what's gonna happen. I see it. Is, is the point here that for a given sample path, it is all or nothing, but this is an expectation. And so there's some, some fudge going on. That's the Correct. point. Correct. I see. Okay, very good, very good, sorry. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Yeah, no, oh, thanks. Um, okay, good. So, so then um, let's see what the, the adaptive policy would do to mimic this, uh, this structure. So I'm gonna set up some threshold. Um, I mentioned earlier how the index of the values that are at play depends on the, on the midpoint of the jumps of the survival function. The threshold that, uh, that I'm gonna set up are exactly those. So those are the midpoints of the jumps of, of the survival functions. And then uh, at any given time, I'm gonna look at the inventory at hand. So the amount of remaining position, the amount of remaining budget that I have at that period. I'm gonna look at the ratio of the inventory at hand over the remaining time. And I'm gonna see where that ratio falls with respect to those thresholds that I've decided, okay? And then uh, I'm gonna select an arrival of that type, even only if um, the value of that arrival is bigger than uh, the value that comes from the index J that is given by where the ratio falls. Okay, and I'm gonna show you a picture of, of how this works. And I'm gonna use this, uh, this rule in, a, in every period, okay? So let's, let's see how this actually is gonna um, work out in an example. So this is a problem, uh, uh, a problem instance in which we have uh, five types. Uh, this is the probability mass function here in the footnote. And here on the Y axis, I have the survival function. Okay, now I said, we're gonna have those thresholds. Let me put the threshold on the slide. So the thresholds are what? They are the midpoint of the survival function. There is an exception for the first threshold, which is always set at zero. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then we are in the chip. Okay, so this is just, this is a function. This, this threshold comes as a, as a result of what is the problem primitive, which is the distribution of the types or the distribution of the values. Okay, and then, what does the, uh, the policy do? What does the online policy do? Well, if the, if the ratio of remaining budget over remaining time falls interval, then the index that is associated with that is one. And so I'm gonna select any value that is better than B1. So I'm only gonna select the very top value in, uh, in this region, okay? And then uh, uh, if the ratio falls the next interval, then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna select any value that is either the highest or the second highest. If the ratio between the remaining uh, inventory and the remaining time falls in the third interval, then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna either select the very best, the second best or the third best and, and so on and so forth. So wherever the ratio falls with respect to those thresholds, then that tells me which is the cutoff a value that I need to select or select better than that particular value. Okay, so this is, so far I did nothing in the sense of, so far there has been no dynamics. I'm just giving you a rule to make decision. Okay, and this is what, this is depending on what? This is depending on any ratio that um, I can see as a, as the ratio between the remaining uh, inventory and the remaining time. Okay, now we're gonna start, we're gonna get some initial condition. And suppose we start with the ratio at time zero that falls here. So we have uh, initial inventory, we have time capital T, we look at the ratio, and this is my initial ratio. This gives me a index 
J naught equal to three, which is the index that corresponds to this threshold that tells me um, select any value that is better than B. Okay, so what's gonna happen next? Well, the ratio remaining inventory over remaining time is gonna fluctuate, right? We're gonna uh, start here and is either gonna go up or is either gonna go down. And what's gonna happen and what we can actually show that it happens is that it does so in a quite predictable way. Okay, so what does it mean? So if I, if I first of all, there are uh, two places where it can go, right? So, so it's either gonna go up the threshold eta four, or it's gonna go down towards the threshold eta three. When does that happen? Well, it goes towards eta four if I don't select the very few arrivals and it's gonna go towards eta three if I do select the very first few arrivals. Okay, so that, that depend, that's gonna depend on the, on, the, uh, on the realization of the values that I'm given. But eventually, it's either gonna get in this region or it's gonna get in that region. Okay, so for instance, in, in this case, I'm uh, uh, plotting here a sample path of the evolution of this ratio over time, and we're gonna get into this region around the threshold eta three, okay? And then the moment you get into this region, what's gonna happen is that the, the ratio remaining inventory over remaining time is gonna stay around this region for most of the time period. How does it do so? Well, because whenever the value of the ratio is above the threshold, then the drift of the ratio process is negative. And whenever the ratio is below that threshold, the drift changes signs and becomes positive. Okay, so, so essentially the drift of this ratio process changes and keeps it pegged around whatever is this, um, this threshold that was selected by what was, the, what was the sample path. Okay, how long does it stay there? For a fairly long time. In particular, there is a stopping time close to the end of the horizon. What does that mean? It means at most a constant number of periods away in expectation. Um, which is the time at which the ratio leaves that region. And then, uh, you know, it's gonna behave wildly towards the end of the horizon. The, the changes of that ratio are gonna be quite substantial because of the changes in the denominator and so on and so forth. But for most of the time period, it's gonna get to the orbit of one of the threshold, either eta three or eta four, and then it's gonna stay in this region for pretty much most of the time. Now, what does it mean with respect to policy? It means, for instance, on this sample path, that all of the V1 and V2 are always selected, while V3 is carefully selected according to where that ratio falls. And so I'm not gonna select all of them. I'm just gonna select the ones that happen to be presented whenever my ratio process is above this eta three line. Okay, and this is, this is essentially trying to mimic what, what the offline policy does. Right, so so then you know eventually we get out of this. We call it a orbit of this particular threshold, and and the and the horizon and the horizon end. Okay, so let's see if there are questions on on this on this picture. So this is pretty much all of the intuition. Yeah, I, I, have have a, I have a question on this one, Jones. Yeah, there is Neil first, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, no, it's just just because no one else is asking a question, but but. So I guess you're sort of saying that it's sort of like there's a it's like an mm one q around eta three there, and so then it's sort of a constant because you've got a negative drift here, a negative drift here. So kind of like the modulus is sort of like constant downward drift, and the expected distance away from that then is going to be a constant, and that's the reason the constant comes in. And and I guess if you just went for the naive policy, you'd get something like square root of t. Would that be right? You just kind of say calculate in advance how many you need in each of the buckets and then and then you just get a random uh error of that which would be about square root of capital t or something probably with, yeah, is, that, is that is that is that is that would that be the intuition there that's correct yeah so the yeah. so the so the the intuition with the queuing argument is very true i mean that's essentially we're going to use some you know concentration tail bound for uh process that hit a particular value, which is something that gets used typically in, in some of those, uh, you know, queuing papers. So that, that connection is definitely there. And you are correct also in what would be the error if you were to just uh, be greedy. So, so that, yeah, that's absolutely yeah. correct. Yes. Uh, Dave? Yeah, my question was pretty similar, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, just to flesh it out even a little further. 
not thinking about queuing or anything, but I guess like given that it's, you know, it's extremely strong that you, you get a, a constant um, regret, the policy looks a lot like a resolve policy, at least, you know, superficially, right? You, you look at kind of what fraction are left and then you go to one of these things. So yeah, maybe you could even reword it again, like what is the secret sauce here? I mean, I, I understand it's, it's gonna stick in this region, et cetera, but like, why doesn't, ex 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 why doesn't a resolve end up sticking in a region like that? Okay, very good. So it is, it is a resolve policy, right? And in fact, when I'm gonna talk about the multiple dimension, um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna exactly frame it as a resolve heuristic, and you write down the LP so relaxation let me, so let me, I'll, I'll just jump in again quickly. Right, the, the previous intuition was that a broad set of resolve problems are going to run into this degeneracy parameter, and people had looked at the resolve policies kind of extensively, and that seemed to be a big issue. So, yeah, why is this different from past resolve policies? Right, so I think I think this is a bit more careful in uh, let me say it, breaking the ties between those two values, right? So the selection here of the boundary values, which are v two, uh, sorry, uh, what happens with v three and what happens with v four, which are the two places where we could go starting with that particular initial condition, that's adaptive with respect to what the sample path that is given to us does. I could give you another sample path in which we would go up here to eta four. And then we're going to fluctuate around here and then eventually get out, right? And that, that, uh, that in that situation, we're going to select, uh, you know, or pretty much all of the V3 I, I guess what I'm well. confused about is any resolve. So I guess the question is, what, what is precisely meant by adaptive with respect to the sample path? Because in some sense, any resolve policy is kind of adaptive going forward based on where you're at, right? Right. So, so the question there is, how do you uh, treat the boundary conditions? Right. Uh, what uh, so are you when, doing when, here that's different than just resolve the remaining problem, and that'll just tell you what to do it in the boundary? Uh, that the um, let me see. The, um, like you framed it at the high level as the offline and the online, and I know you know in in several related works that that's the theme, but. Here it seems less obvious exactly how that's happening versus in some of the other framings, you know, it's it's kind of obvious that you're 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 trying to couple these things. Right. Where is the so, so, here? so I think I think the answer to that comes from this uh, midpoint of uh, from the way those thresholds are set up, which is far away from the jump of the distribution, and they give you enough buffer uh, for saying, uh, oh, I'm gonna select V3 in all of this region. Or oh, even though the resolve policy would not be as uh, as precise, I suppose around those. Regions. I see. Okay. Right? That, so so that's that, that's the buffer that comes from. Uh, I see. Because if you if you think about um, you know the um, a resolve, the the solution is going to depend on the distribution itself, right? And so it's going to depend on whatever is the fraction of types. Uh, uh, the fractions of arrivals of a certain type that you get to see, and the question is what happens when you are in situations in which you need to break type be, be, break a type between two different types and those offset thresholds allow you to break the tie in a so way that so works your out point well. is just in principle the f bar v5 and f bar v4 could be really close together but the v4 the a to 4 and a to 3 cuz i i guess the a's are some constant thresholds and the f bars are some constant thresholds the eta's depend on the distribution, right? They're these correct. They are the midpoint. Yeah. So I just, I guess, I don't understand completely the point you just made in that it's a different set of thresholds that have a different spacing. Why are the eta thresholds more robust than the f bar thresholds? It looks like they're all just thresholds that depend on the distribution somehow. Because because if you're not bounded away from the f bar threshold, then you're gonna pay a root n sort of error by of mistaken selections. So, so here, the point is the need... natural thresholds are uniquely bad, is the point. Correct, correct. I see. Huh. Right, so in this way, right, okay. so if you think about how many values D1 do I get? I get a binomial number that has F bar 2 mean and then the tail that behaves like a binomial tail. 
how many of you know v2 values I get? Well, that's the corresponding binomial numbers, right? If I were to center things at the mean instead of at the offset threshold, then I cannot leverage exponential decay. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. You. So I think I think that's that yeah, the, that the answer sense. to that question. Okay. Good. Thanks. So so then this uh, this policy is what this mean reversal. Uh, property, which is what, what Neil was pointing at, which says that as soon as the ratio of remaining time, remaining inventory of remaining time reaches the orbit uh, of one of the thresholds, then it stays within that orbit for almost all time periods. Uh, we have the orbit entering time, which is the first time we get close to a threshold. We have the index that gets selected by um, that entrance when the, the threshold gets identified. And then we're gonna stay there pretty much until the end of the time horizon, um, uh, meaning a constant away. We're gonna leave a constant number of periods away before the end of the time horizon in, in expectation. So, so which is the key result here that says that for uh, all time and initial budget, there is a constant that depends on the distribution of the value. So that depends on this epsilon value that tells you that the expected value of the exit time is a constant away from, from the end of the horizon. How do we prove that? This is a concentration result by IEC 1982 for adapted sequences with uniformly bounded drift when the sequence exceeds a level, which is the result that has been used in, in queuing for a number of these uh, analogous uh, arguments. Okay, and so so then uh, if we implement this policy, what's going to happen is that uh, up to uh, this... Alessandra. So, if the p's are really close, does this still achieve root t implemented as is? Like, say the p's are like two to the minus t close to each other, or something like this. Does does root t still naturally pop out somehow of this right. as is? So so as long as the distribution does not depend on time or budget, then you're fine because concentration is eventually gonna kick in. Of, of if, course. Uh, so I... Meaning as long as your epsilon has nothing to do with, um, you know, sure, sure, but I, budget, I guess I meant, if it did happen to be that P and T were kind of scaling together, does this still kind of somehow cap out at root T even if the P's are somehow extremely close? Or small, if the P's are, some of the P's are extremely small is what I would say. So, so if the P's are extremely small, but independent of say time and budget, then we are in good shape. If they are not independent of time and budget, then you can construct examples in which the regret is gonna uh, grow like routine. But it, it can't be bigger. I guess what I'm saying is in this algorithm, can it ever be bigger than root T if the distribution is very pathological? Um, I don't think it can. Uh, uh, I think root t should be should be true. Should still be the absolute bound. Okay, that's what I mean. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, All right, good. Other other comments? All right, great. Um, okay, so so then what the? Let me just pull up the all of the all of the slides. So what the what the policy does up to this stopping time, which is the time at which we leave the orbit of one of the thresholds. What did we? What did the picture suggest? It suggested that we selected up to the stopping time all of the good types. We um, selected a carefully chosen amount of uh, um, values at the cutoff that actually matches what the offline policy would do here up to a constant in expectation. And we selected a carefully chosen amount of the other value that took cutoff uh, in expectation um, except uh, um, that in the same way that as the offline policy does, except for a for a constant. Okay, so these are all pretty much all of the ingredients that you need to get this uniformly bounded regret. So we we select all of the good types, we reject all of the bad types, and we match what the offline policy does with respect to the two values, which in the picture were v3 and v4, that are around the ratio in the in the initial condition. The expected value of the stopping time is a constant away from the end of the horizon. So when you put all of those things together, you get the order one regret, right? So just to, to state this formally, there is a policy uh, and there is a constant that depends only on the value distribution such that the gap between uh, the offline solution 
and this budget ratio policy that I described is uh, uniformly bounded by a constant that does not depend on time and does not depend on uh, uh, on the initial budget. Okay. Um, now, um, questions, comments? Quick question: Is the M yes. here the same as the M on the last slide? No, the M's are changing. So the M's are uh, all some variation of uh, you know there is epsilon in the denominator and there is V1 potentially in the numerator and, and some other constant that shows up, right? So, so but it, the point is it depends only on, on the value distribution, okay? Now, um, so I have just, a, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, of course. So I guess one would, you know, one would have naively thought that the F bar things would be the good thresholds just because they're more exact somehow. Mm -hmm. And so presumably there's, you know, there's the exactness and there's the robustness and the robustness wins. Why are you not losing on the exactness front in some sense? Like why, does that make sense kind of? Yeah, so, so let, me, let me try to put it this way. So, um, so if you stay at the exact jumps of the survival function, right? Uh, you're not gonna get any benefit that comes from concentration. So you're not gonna mimic this uh, property that was coming in the offline solution that you were selecting most of the good types and uh, rejecting uh, most of the bad types, right? Why? Because what is the probability that a binomial is bigger than is mean? Well, that is not exponentially small. Sure. What is the probability that a binomial is bigger than mean plus constant times n? That goes down exponentially fast, right? So that's essentially what, what makes this argument right. You don't make any mistakes because the thresholds were not exact. You you make a constant number of mistakes in experience. The point is that's just a constant. Okay. Yes. Okay. But but you do make the mistakes, and the 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 the, the key here is that the the threshold are bounded away from the jumps, right? If they were not to be bounded away, then then you'd be you'd be in trouble. Uh, now, just for uh, uh, let me just also compare uh, graphically how these policy works with, uh, compares with respect to the dynamic programming policy that you can actually compute. So here we have on the x-axis, we have uh, um, the initial budget. Uh, the time here is uh, a capital T equal to 1000. So this uh, C should be I naught. So let me just replace it. Um, and, and so on uh, the solid red line is the regret of the algorithm I described. And the dash blue line is the regret of the optimal dynamic programming policy. The difference between those two policies is that the budget ratio policy treats all states inventory and remaining time that share the same ratio equally, while the dynamic programming policy does not need to do that. So there are some pairs, remaining, remaining state, remaining period, remaining inventory, remaining time for which the two policies agree, but things are, are pretty close with respect to each other overall. Okay, now what I want to do next is I want to see how this idea, this policy that uh, uh, keeps the ratio remaining uh, inventory over remaining time close to one of the special changes when I move to multiple dimensions. Okay, the insight is going to be there, but it's going to be much more geometric, and we're going to see regions uh, where essentially the ratios of remaining inventory over remaining time are being attracted to. Okay, so let me let me try to to set that up, and so we're going to be talking about online stochastic pack, stochastic packing. This is also known as the uh, you know capacity control ne network revenue management problem for those who are familiar with that formulation. So what do we have? We have requests of multiple types that arrive over a finite horizon with the period. We have a decision maker that chooses to serve uh, whether to serve an incoming request. And if a, if a request is served, then that request generates a reward and depletes some amount of resources. We have a initial vector of inventory of resources available at time zero that is to be depleted over time. And the goal is just as before to maximize the sum of the um, rewards of the uh, resources that are served in, in expectation. Okay, so here the notation, I'm, I'm abusing a bit of notation and everything is gonna become a, a vector based. So we have the resources and we have a initial inventory vector. So each 
element in this vector it corresponds to the inventory of that particular uh, resource. We have T arriving requests, which are type J request arrives with probability PJ. There is a, that request is associated with a vector of resources that are depleted if that, uh, if that request is, is served. Um, when the request arrives, we get to see the reward that is associated with that, with that particular request. And the decision we need to make is exactly the same one, which is we need to decide whether to serve the arriving request. We end uh, all of the decisions at terminal. Uh, we cannot change them at a later time. And, and so on and so forth. Uh, the goal is to maximize the expected sum of the uh, reward of the selected request. And, and here in this problem, uh, cursor dimensionality does show up. Uh, it cannot be solved optimally. And so the proposing of an algorithm uh, is, becomes very, very important. And in particular, we're gonna propose an algorithm that is uh, inspired by what we did in the, in the one dimension. And we're gonna benchmark it against the offline solution. What is the offline solution? The offline solution is the one that gets to see all of the requests arrive. And then only at the end of the horizon uh, chooses which one uh, to serve. And the focus again is gonna be on regret. So the expected difference between the, uh, the offline solution and uh, uh, what, what, the, what the algorithm does, okay? So, um, Dave mentioned a number of times, uh, uh, well, this is a resolve heuristic or uh, um, uh, so, so here is um, a, a linear programming relaxation that is gonna show up in the multiple dimensional version of this, of this problem. We have uh, um, everything here is scaled. So, so when I think about a resource vector, uh, capital R, I'm thinking about the ratios for of the inventory to the remaining time for each of the available resources. And when I think about the demand vector, I'm just thinking about the probability of a request of a given type to show up, right? So P here is a vector that tells me what is the probability that any given request can show up in, in the next period. Um, what we are uh, uh, doing with this LP is we are satisfying our capacity constraint in expectation. Uh, we are satisfying demand in expectation and we're trying to maximize uh, reward. Uh, the decision variable is Y, which is uh, um, the, the request that are selected or the request that are, uh, that are rejected, okay? Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna resolve this LP in, a, in every period. And what we're gonna plug in is we're gonna plug in the ratio of inventory to remaining time for that particular period. The P vector stays the same because this is given that the distribution of the, of the arriving resources, okay? And so how does the algorithm work? Well, the algorithm computes the ratio at any given time period, solves the LP by plugging in the ratio of the resources to the remaining time to obtain the decision variables. And then how are we gonna use those decision variables to uh, to make decision? Well, if it is not feasible to serve the resource, then the resource is rejected. If the decision variable for that resource type is smaller than one over two times PJ, so half the probability of that um, request type arriving, then uh, it's not worthy for us to, to serve uh, that, that request. While on the other hand, if we have enough remaining capacity and if the solution of the LP pool is larger than half the probability of that particular rival for that particular type, then we do serve that particular resource. And again, going back to Dave's question about, uh, you know, what, what's the catch here in the, in the heuristic? The catch here is that we are offsetting and we are comparing the solution of the LP with respect to some fraction of the probability of that particular type arriving. Okay, uh, you could choose anything different than one over two as long as it's bounded away is strictly between zero and one. So that gives you enough separation for everything to work. And that's, and that's what would happen in, uh, in, uh, in the single dimensional problem if you were to use this LP to solve that particular problem and get that solution that I, that I mentioned earlier. Okay, and then uh, given this decision for uh, accepting or rejecting arriving request, uh, then we update our inventory and we move to the next period. Okay, so this is, this is the algorithm. And so what I wanna do now 
is I want to show you what happens in an example with um, two resources and four request type. Okay, so what does it mean that we have two resources? We have only two resources available. We have types that arrive that use different combination of those resources. Some types are more expensive in terms of resources they use. Sometimes are less expensive in terms of resources they use. On the, on the horizontal axis here, I have the ratio of remaining inventory for the first resource over remaining time. So all of those ratios are somewhere between zero and one. And I plot all of them on the X axis. And then on the Y axis, I have the same ratio for the other resource. Okay, so you can think that at any given time during our planning horizon, in this particular problem instance, we're going to find ourselves at some pair of ratios for resource A and resource B. Okay, and so the question is, what do we do when we are in that pair? Well, we're going to solve the LP and we're going to look at uh, assuming that is feasible uh, given remaining capacity to serve a particular resource of a certain type we're going to look at what we're going to look at the set of types which the solution of the lp is bigger than half times the probability of that type arriving okay so for instance if i look at this uh, rhombus like region in blue on uh, on the on the slide this is what this is a set of ratios for resource A and for resource B that all lead to what action? Action of selecting type one and type two. Okay. Vice versa, if I look at this square in blue at the in, on the on the top right corner, this is what this is a situation in which the ratio for resource A is high, the ratio for resource B is high, and what does what does the algorithm tell you to do? It tells you to serve resources one, two, three, and four, meaning I have plenty of resources, sorry, to serve requests one, two, three, and four. I have plenty of resources, and so I can uh, serve any request that arrives. Okay, so the color coding here is selecting all of the pairs for the ratios of resources A and B that lead to the same action, that lead to the same set of requests to be accepted. Okay, so this is one and two. Here I am serving only request type one. Here I'm serving only request type two. Here I'm serving only requests type two and uh, one and three. Here two and three, and and so on and so forth. Okay, so so given a pair, I'm finding a set of request types. That and the algorithm tells me to serve for that particular pair of resource ratios. And then I can find the set, the equivalent set of all ratios that lead to the same outcome, which is what you see that is color coded on, uh, on, the, on the screen, okay? And now, what are, what are those red dots at the center? Well, those red dots at the center are centered budget. So those are the pairs of ratios such that there is a equality between uh, the ratio of the resources available and the consumption uh, that, that happens in, in serving those, those resources, okay? Now, what does, what does this boil down to in terms of the one-dimensional version of the problem that I just discussed? Well, the, the budget correspond to actually the jumps of the survival function. This is what Dave was asking about. And the set, that lead to the same action or what? They are exactly the set that I described earlier that were given by the midpoints, the intervals um, that were in between the midpoints of the jumps of the survival function, okay? So this is essentially what the algorithm does here. And uh, um, for, uh, for, uh, for reference, let me compare uh, this uh, partition of the, of the unit square that is the that contains all of the action regions of the algorithm with the with the analogous partitioning of the unit square uh, that takes the that that has the action region that would come out of the dp this is a two resources for type request we can actually solve it uh, numerically and this is the comparison you get okay so so here on the right hand side you have the dp action regions And here on the left hand side, you have the budget ratio 
algoritmu. Action region. And you see that those two are pretty close, right? I mean, uh, uh, and uh, and so so the what's going to happen next is I'm just going to essentially wave my hands and and tell you that all of the insights that we got in the in the one dimension that had that you know you start at a particular ratio and then you are attracted to a threshold and then you live there for most of the time period. There is an analog uh, of that in multiple dimension that tells you that. If you, if you start in a particular action region, then your ratio lives in uh, some version of that action region for most of those time period, okay? And, uh, and so in particular, what you can, uh, uh, you can use that to obtain a analogous constant regret bound, which says that uh, the algorithm that I just described uh, achieves uniformly bounded regret. There is a constant, that does not depend on the time period or does not really depend on the resource vector that caps the difference between the offline solution and the, and the value, the expected value that you get from implementing the algorithm. And, uh, and that the argument that, that proves this is a geometric version of the, of the things I said earlier about the single dimension. So, so we can actually study a quite in detail where this vector of ratio goes to and where it's spent most of the time. And in those places, um, in those regions, th those regions tend to agree with the regions and with the actions that the offline solution uh, would take. Uh, let me just say a couple of more words about, um, about this theorem. So this theorem actually is stronger than the way I wrote it on, on the screen. Uh, you can actually also account for uh, slow resource restocking. So, which means that over time, resources can be replenished as long as that does not happen too frequently. Uh, the, the constant regret bound still holds. And the constant regret bound also holds under misspecification of model parameters, meaning if you're running the model, uh, if uh, V and P are your value vector and your uh, arrival probability vectors, and those are your two parameters, but you run your algorithm with some uh, misspecified a pair of parameters, then the constant regret bound again uh, holds as long as this misspecification is is not too much, and we make that uh, we make that reverse. Also, let me say that this result has been in the literature for some time. Uh, there was a 20, 20 paper by He Wang and and a student of his that proved a constant regret bound for uh, network revenue management. There is a paper by e, Alberto Vera and uh, Sid Banerjee in 2021 that also prove uh, a similar result. So the, the result is definitely not new, but what we focus here is on uh, the geometric analysis of this problem and, uh, and uh, uh, what happens with respect to all of those ratio processes and where do they spend most of, the, of their time. And that is what allows us to connect the solution that comes from the algorithm with respect to the uh, to the solution that comes from the uh, the offline uh, full information problem. Um, so I think I think I can actually uh, maybe uh, wrap things up here. Uh, I think we are six minutes ago, and uh, and see if there are uh, if there are any questions. Maybe one quick question. So you mentioned yeah, here about mis misspecification in V yeah. and P. Does that mean because because so far you've assumed that the distributions are known, uh, the values and the yeah. and the probabilities, but if that result holds, does that mean that potentially you could estimate them over time, and then once you're in that, that's, rough region, that's correct. With, yeah, 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 yeah. And so then yeah. you'd have constant regret, but you could also have some sort of statistical learning of the parameters as right. you go. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's great. So yeah. let me let me. Uh, and does that apply that to the secretary version as well? Yeah. So so think yeah. about so so in in the secretary version, what would that be? Right. That would be a perturbation on the survival function, mm -hmm. right? Or yeah. a uh, perturbation on uh, um, uh, the the value distribution, right? Well, well, if 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 that happens, but the actions are actually not gonna um, change. Mm -hmm. Right, because the perturbation is not too much, then then of course your reward is going to be similar. Why? Because we have we are leveraging the separation that happens from that comes from the discreteness, 
Okay, so as long as the perturbation uh, lives within that separation, then we are in general in a, in a good shape. And uh, you know, I can make this uh, more formal, but that's mm -hmm. that's the insight, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, hi. Can I ask a few questions? Of course. Yeah. So, firstly, uh, do you assume that your A matrix is either zero or one? Correct. Yes. So, uh, and how does uh, so, like, let's say if you're in the one-dimensional multi-secretary case, how does it change if it's no longer zero one? So, if a secretary consumes a budget of two or something like that. Okay. Very good. So, so. Um... The I think in the in the multi-secretary case the problem there is uh, is not really when is a discrete amount of consumption but when the 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 weight uh, that gets consumed or the amount that gets consumed is continuous because in that case the problem becomes much more tricky you are in the in the context of a knapsack problem with uh, uh, continuous weight and there you cannot get constant regret. Uh, but if it was some discrete type of consumptions then. Like I'm trying to even think what budget ratio would look like in that case. Uh, so if it is the, some discrete type of consumption, I think I think you are you should be okay mostly by rescaling things appropriately. I see. Right. So but, so so. Because in that, I would assume that you would want to do some bang for buck kind of uh, scheduling, rather right. than. So, so I think I think one way would be so in the multi-secondary first problem. Suppose that you have a certain reward, but that uses two slots or two units of capacity. Well, then you can I suppose just cut the reward enough and say this should be equivalent to a version of the problem in which the reward of that particular applicant is cut enough and uses only one uh, unit of capacity. Nice. Right. So you can connect those in in some way, and and I think I think that that should follow. I mean, I've not. I've not wrote an argument about this, but I think I think that is what what should happen. Okay, and the intuition for your uh, constant regret in slow restock, but not under let's say large restock, is that the offline becomes too powerful? Is that is that Correct. intuition? Correct. Yes. Which is also, by the way, what happens when you have continuous wave. Offline is too powerful. So when you when you have a bunch of continuous wave and you sort them and you just serve them by, suppose that the rewards are all equal and uh, uh, you serve them from the smallest to the largest by using as little capacity as possible at every, at every iteration, then, then the, when things are continuous, then the offline can be much better. Um, I have a related question. I guess the same yeah. holds when, you, when, when the uh, uh, distribution of rewards are uh, are continuous as well. Um, well so um, I think I think distribution of rewards being continuous is uh, uh, somewhat simpler uh, because because you're not you're not making so the the rewards uh, but yeah but okay I think it is somewhat simpler but I've not thought too much about it. I see. Yeah, um, kind of my question is what what happens when the when the when it is you know reward distribution is continuous. Um, yeah, so so in that case, I, I I don't know actually. I mean, so the the offline solution is still the same, right? So you're going to be the sum uh, of your first uh, you know i i not order statistics that is a well understood object. Uh, you know how much do you lose? By by doing it sequentially, that that actually is a is a good question. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. All right. If if there are no more questions, let's uh, let's thank the speaker for an excellent talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording, uh, but if anyone wants to hang around a little bit longer, welcome. Yeah, I'll, I'll be. I can stick around for a bit longer. But yes, now that the recording is stopped, I can also <laughs> say all of the political. I'll stop the screen. I'll stop the screening too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And stream. thank you so much. Yeah. So, you, so yeah. Then in that case where everything's stochastic, you can kind of learn the rates because it's not on the boundary in any way. Once you're in that region, you're fine. And then 
Okay. And do you have a write-up of that in your original paper as well? 